Hello everyone and welcome. I hope you're having a fantastic time. The sun is out. Uh, it's a beautiful Delhi weekend and it's terrific to have all of you with us. This is a very special session for me and special because we're going to spend some time talking about the one family that most of us grew up in. Shiv is kind of fudgy by his actions, his thinking. He wasn't born into the army like the rest of us, but we accept him as being an army brat. So I am absolutely delighted and privileged to welcome uh, my colleagues, friends, and superstar journalists. Can I have a very warm round of applause as you welcome first Gaurav Savan. You've seen his exploits uh, most recently in Ukraine. Uh, before that, back in the day, he was a superstar. He was born a superstar in Kargil when he went out for the longest time. He even wrote a fantastic book. He'll talk to us about that. Shivaru runs India Today Television. Uh, he's had extensive experience covering the military, matters, defense, and also writing three books along with Rahul Singh, who isn't a colleague at this moment, but feels like one. He's part of the India Today family in many ways, and we're delighted to have him here as well. So Thank welcome, you. all of you. I went to an army school, and there were kids I grew up with who went on to do exemplary acts of bravery and courage and win honors. I won't name them because I say this in the context of them back in school. When I looked at them, I said, there's nothing about them which looks remarkable or nothing about them which gives you a sense that here is someone who would grow up to be a hero in Kargil, who would grow up to do something very courageous in a special operation. So what makes someone brave? What is it inside somebody's DNA, his upbringing, his culture, his ethos, which makes him rise to the occasion. When the day comes, when your nation needs, when your commanding officer commands, what is it that makes him step up? Now you've got people who've written books, spanning wars, spanning special operations, and they have a sense as we join these dots together to try and understand what makes someone India's most fearless. So I'll start with Gaurav. On the back of all the experience that you have, as a reporter, as an anchor, as an editor, you've covered so many stories of courage. What is it, according to you, that is common between the heroes that you've profiled? What makes somebody brave? What makes somebody fearless? It's the attitude. It's the attitude they're either born with or it's the attitude that comes to them uh, when they are in that situation. Because in that situation, you can either become a hero or you can be a coward. And it can happen. It can happen to you uh, in, in that instance. So, for example, in Kargil, when you had the Pakistanis on all the heights and you had the Indian soldiers who were climbing up and every petrol was either coming back unsuccessful or falling in the line of fire, you had these men, officers and jawans who would say, we can do it. Minus 10 degrees temperature, Rahul, they would take off their shoes because that's the only way they could grip that rope to climb. Take off their bulky ba balaclavas and jackets and in sub-zero temperature, just in their shirt sleeves and trousers, they would climb the rope to be able to get a toe hold on that mountain, to be able to climb and reach on top. So it was, I will not or I will not give that was their attitude that made them do it and they did it. And we were very honored and privileged to have watched that firsthand. Shiv, you've now written three books profiling India's brave hearts. Do you see a pattern as you join these dots in the character profile of our war heroes, uh, peacetime heroes who do something which you don't imagine any normal person to be capable of doing? You, uh, you know, Rahul, uh, it's, it's actually amazing uh, how common the attitude of all military heroes is. Uh, you know, one would, one would expect that uh, in the writing of these books, when we met many of these military heroes, uh, you know, given the superhuman things that they've achieved, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, they would have a chip on their shoulder, they would have an air about them. But uh, I'll just take two small examples to illustrate the point I'm trying to make, which is that... Uh, these these guys, Kirti Chakra, Paramvir Chakra, Mahavir Chakra, whatever it is, I found this absolutely unbelievable common 
point among all these heroes that I spoke to, and I'll take those two examples. One is the Galwan incident, Rahul, uh, which was uh, a soldier called Havaldar Dharamveer who survived. And the other is uh, 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 Major, um, I can't take his name, but everyone knows what his name is, the Major who led the Uri surgical strikes. Uh, these two, the, a soldier and an officer, and they both said precisely the same thing when I asked them the, the question that you've asked, Rahul. What is it that made you so brave in those circumstances? And their identical answer was, Any would, anyone would have done the same thing in our situation. We just happened to be in that situation. You know, fate dictated that we were in that situation at that point of time, and we had to decide. But anyone else in the forge would have acted in the same brave manner. So they were, they were not, uh, they were completely discounting their uniqueness. They were basically saying, we in the forge are built to be brave, and only some of us get to be in the situations where we've got to do something big, and there is no decision for us because failure is not an option. You know, I've heard some Brevat say it, but that's actually not true, and I'll tell you why. See what's happening in the Russia-Ukraine war at this moment. If anyone is supposed to be brave, then the Russian army is being anything but brave. They're retreating against a week of four. So it's not as if you put somebody in a particular circumstance, Rahul, and he'll rise to the occasion. There is something in the milieu of the armed forces, that particular pultern, uh, the grouping, their josh, their attitude, individual bravery, individual mental outlook that makes somebody stand and not flee. You're seeing what the Russian army is doing in any of the stories all of you have profiled are about people who rose to the occasion when it mattered most. While I agree with the, what Gaurav and Shiv say, I feel two aspects stand out. One is sense of purpose, and the other is I'll make my training count. This is what really distinguishes uh, these heroes. I'll give you a small example. One of the heroes we've written about is a guy called Major K.B. Singh, Konjangbam Brijendra Singh from Manipur, who uh, grew up in a small village on the Assam-Manipur uh, border, uh, a village called uh, Dibong. And, um, you know, uh, he was just seven or eight years old when uh, uh, insurgents would come to their house uh, at, uh, un at an un ungodly hour and uh, ask his parents to, uh, you know, whip up a quick meal for them. And this particular night was Yashong. Yashong is the uh, Manipuri equivalent of Holi. And uh, the kids had gone to bed early. And these three uh, insurgents came in with their uh, automatic weapons and said, please give us a meal. That was one holy this eight-year-old boy never forgot. Twenty years on, he was posted in the same area as a young major this time. Major KB. And um, he had been planning an operation for a long time. I'm talking about sense of purpose. Uh, so his commanding officer says, when do you want to launch that operation? He says, on holy. So holy had been this recurring theme. Uh, he says, why holy? Uh, uh, he says, holy because... Uh, this is the time they would be least expecting us. And Isbariyam Kholi, Khun Se Khelege. This was what he said. It was not that he did it, uh, you know, it was some fanciful thing he wanted to do. He had planned for this operation for six, seven months. The operation lasted six, uh, three, three to four days. And um, they wiped out uh, some of the top militant le uh, leaders in, uh, in that part of uh, Manipur. And uh, he used to get uh, calls from the insurgents saying, Hame pata hai, tumhari maa ka naam kya hai, tumhari bhai ka gaadi ka number ye hai. So I asked him, were you not scared? He says, sir, I'm doing the right thing. Why do I have to be scared? So that was that sense of purpose this man grew up with. And when he was leading this team of 14, 15 uh, of some of the best fighting men of uh, Assam Rifles, he knew that they had been training for this day and they would all make their training count. So those two things, uh, a sense of purpose and uh, uh, the confidence in their training. As we speak so much about the war heroes, let's spend a moment focusing on the families that give them the courage, the support and the backing to do what they do. And what struck me as remarkable as I went through Rahul and Shiv's book is the instances where the wife of a fallen officer or a Jawan has signed up to join the services saying, I will take forward my husband's mission. And that gives me goosebumps. Shiv, you've just lost your loved one. Typically, you'd imagine that somebody retreats into a shell, 
hates the army that took your loved one away from you. Instead, you've got young children, wives saying, I want to don that uniform. It's, it's actually incredible. I, I think there are uh, five, five occasions across our three books, uh, Rahul, in which uh, officers or soldiers have lost their lives uh, and, their, um, uh, you know, and their wives have uh, uh, given up a, a pretty stable life. Uh, you know, uh, one was a professor in a college, uh, one worked with an investment bank, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, one was a physical education teacher in a school, uh, just to sign up for the army. Uh, one of the, uh, uh, many people here may not know this, but one of the Veer Chakra uh, awardees of the Galvan Clash, uh, his wife, uh, Rahul, who lives in a small village in, uh, in uh, Madhya Pradesh, has just uh, uh, entered the army. She's at the academy, she's going to be in the army very soon. Another one is already a logistics officer. She lost her husband post the Pulwama clash. Uh, and we, we've spoken to all of these, uh, these, uh, these army ladies. We've spoken to them and asked them, uh, what was it? Why did you feel the need to do this? Uh, and for them, uh, you, know, once, you know, once the media spotlight over the death of an officer or soldier kind of evaporates, their only army, and you know this, Rahul, the only army is the forge. You know, the unit stays in touch with the families. The unit is there to help the families with anything they want. And I think that kind of fuels a sense of purpose. And they feel that the only way to keep their husband's legacy alive or, uh, you know, to complete an incomplete mission in the case of young officers or soldiers is to join the forge themselves. It may seem very irrational because some of them have young children. It completely uproots them. It disjoints their life. But they've got an absolutely razor sharp sense of purpose when they say, I don't care how I'm going to do it. I'm going to train. I'm going to get into the forge. And, and they all have. And you describe, Rahul, several of these instances where a Jawan or an officer about to go on a special operations mission, for example, is calling his loved one, his wife, uh, just as an example. He can't tell her what he's doing. She can sense something is amiss. And there are instances of them Googling the weather to get a sense of how things are wherever they are posted. And yet they're never saying no. They're never stopping them or emotionally blackmailing them. Uh, to be careful, they're just saying, you go out and do the right thing. So, uh, very rightly said. So, there's uh, all, all of these guys, even as we speak, uh, the army is launching hundreds of operations in the mountains of Kashmir, in the jungles of Northeast. Uh, most of these uh, soldiers who go out on uh, these missions have a quick uh, WhatsApp call, or if it's a signal permit, or a quick call with their families. And um, imagine... Uh, Imagine the anxiety of the family when you see the last seen message was three days ago or four days ago and you can't get through to the number. It can be like really overwhelming. And um, uh, so there's this one lady, she called up uh, her husband's cosmet. She says, I can't get through to him. What do I do? He hasn't called me. He says, don't worry if he hasn't called you. Just pray that nobody else calls you. You know, how it is. So, and these families are so inspiring, Rahul. All of us have met these families. All of us come from army families. Shiv is also now half army. And um, when you talk to these people, uh, the fortitude they show. I was having a chat with uh, Group Captain Varun Singh's father. He's a Rajarif officer, Colonel K.P. Singh. And when I speak with him, it's as if nothing has happened. He talks so fondly about Varun, so, talks so fondly about what Varun achieved in his... He, Varun was in his 30s when he, you know, he... he uh, uh, he was uh, one of the officers who died in the serious chopper crash. But we wrote about him, not for that, but for, uh, for a really crazy uh, mission he undertook in uh, a few years ago for which he got a Shorya Chakra. He was asked to eject, eject thrice, three or four times ship, if I remember rightly. But he did not because he was flying in LCA and he did not want the LCA's reputation, the first India-built fighter, to get tarnished. So uh, when, when, when the families talk about these things, for instance, uh, can I take a minute? So, uh, uh, Varun was one of the guys who was uh, shortlisted for the Gaganyan mission. And he didn't make it because, uh, you know, there's something, you have to have a certain amount of jaw density. That was the reason he couldn't make it. So, his father says Varun's favorite line was, your destiny is, <laughs> you, you know, your, your, uh, your, your, uh, your jaw, jaw bone uh, uh, decides your destiny. You know, that kind of, they come up with these anecdotes and you don't really uh, feel as if they've, you know, the, what they've undergone. And speaking of anecdotes and lines which keep you going, ye dil mange more. Mm. Now just imagine, you've come back from a mission which was successful. Most 
such officers are, or jawans are pulled back and you send a second team out because they've just gone, risked their lives, come back. You give them some break, you allow them to recuperate. And Captain Vikram Batra wasn't like that. Not just was he sent, I think it was by Colonel Joshi at that time. He also wanted to go. You've just baal baal bachke wapis aaye. And here's this young man who's uh, telling the country, dil mange more. So, uh, 5140 was the peak that he had won. And these were some of the initial victories in Kargil. Very difficult ones, Rahul. Uh, because uh, the Pakistanis were very well entrenched. So, 5140 happened, Tololing happened, the entire country knew about Ye Dil Mange more. Um, and in that operation, uh, because they were exposed to the weather, uh, they'd, they'd given up their woolens just to be able to climb. Uh, he had fever. Vikram Batra had fever. So he was supposed to go down uh, for r and rest and recuperation. But he heard on the wireless the two teams that had gone for uh, 0.4875. Uh, which was uh, later known as Gun Hill and now Batra Top, uh, the teams that went up, they couldn't reach the top. Somewhere down the line, the Pakistanis had their machine guns so effectively deployed that every advance was being pushed back and casualties were happening. So this is the time he volunteered. He said, I know the lay of the land. I am acclimatized. The new team will take time. I know what will happen. And... Uh, then Colonel, now General Y.K. Joshi, uh, uh, he kept saying, no, you need to rest, you need to rest. He said, I'm the only one who can do it. And actually, he was the only one who could do it. He went up despite the fever. He was a brave heart. I mean, it's, it's, in, it's in your DNA. You're built, you're meant to do it. He knew he would do it. And uh, he was able to break, break through the cordon, get to the last bunker, lob the grenade, fire at the Pakistanis, destroy it. Unfortunately... That's the time, very heavy bombardment from the other side and a very accurate machine gun fire took him down. But not before he captured that place and ensured. No, what happens is the moment you capture, the enemy mounts a counter-attack. So you not only capture that point, then you turn everything around to be able to beat back the counter-attack. And this is where leadership really matters. And his leadership mattered at that point of time, Rahul. So what's the most dangerous thing, Gaurav, that's ever happened to you as a war reporter. So, Shiv and I were together in Libya. Uh, we entered Libya illegally. Without telling you, because you would have said no. Uh, we had our visa for, uh, for Egypt. We tried to get into Libya legally and we couldn't. So, one night Shiv and I said, we can't come to Egypt and then go back. With the Bedouins, we actually crossed a part of the Sahara Desert uh, in the middle of the night with them, with some others, with $10,000, $5,000 each in our pocket, without a visa, without knowing where we were going. And if somebody had killed us and buried us in the desert, we wouldn't have known. But we managed to get inside. We managed to get to Raslanu. We got strafed by Colonel Gaddafi's uh, Air Force, the rebels, but we survived. Gaurav, one day I'll tell you why. You know, he had gone to Ukraine. Uh, Mercifully, his wife, Aditi, is not here right now. And he told her some other story, okay? About where he was and what he was doing. And, of course, I was... Uh, I mean, I knew where he was. And uh, where Aditi called me and said, uh, you know, Maha pe hai Gaurav, something basically about getting away. And I, I was about to tell her that I'm telling him the same thing. Maha, just leave Kiev and get out. And ye maan hi rai. he's telling her... That Rahul's got me over there, he not give me. I'm like, that's not true. And the problem is, you know, you do this in school when, for example, you've gone off with a particular girl without telling your parents and then, you know, that happened like in the army public school some 20 years ago. Oh, exactly same wali feeling I. I said, this time I've told my wife something. And she's asking me to And if I reveal the truth, then he's had it and more importantly, I've had it. So anyway, somehow it clicked at that instance. Gaurav's back in one piece and that's what matters most. Shiv, tell us your wildest story. Both, both Gaurav and I had emails 11 days after entering Libya from our family saying, why the hell didn't you tell us you're going to Libya? And this was an era before smartphones. So there was no WhatsApp, uh, no uh, 4G, 5G. There was no G itself. There was nothing. And uh, so we didn't have any connectivity anywhere. But uh, uh, just two small incidents which, I, uh, which I'll tell you about what happened to us in Libya. Uh, both Gaurav and I got... Uh, uh, quote-unquote kidnapped separately on two separate occasions and we both got out of them 
in exactly the same way. So Rahul, what happened was, look, Libya is like this obscure country. I, you know, I don't think anybody would go to Libya in their lifetime unless it, it is for work or you, you, you have some, or you're a smuggler or you're an ISIS terrorist or something like that. Otherwise, you're not going to go there. Okay. Rahul was a good enough boss to actually send Gaurav and me there during the war. So... Uh, there was this, uh, the Egyptian, Indian ambassador to Egypt had basically told Gaurav and me, you guys shouldn't go to Libya. Just stay here. It's nice here. I'll give you a room. Relax here. You tell your office you went there and they sent you back. But Gaurav and me being the journalists we are, we crossed illegally like he said. So promptly five days later, Gaurav got kidnapped. Okay. Uh, and uh, he, and so I, I had no idea where Gaurav was for 48 hours. No phones, no WhatsApp. Just imagine a world without WhatsApp, guys, for one second. Okay? No contact. I have no idea where he is. I don't know where to go because everyone speaks Arabic. He had forgotten the magic word that the ambassador had taught him, saying, if you are in a tight spot with people, just remember these two words, Sahafi Al-Hind, which means uh, Indian journalist in Arabic. Uh, and he finally remembered it on day two, and he said it to those guys, and they let him go. And... The reason why that's a big deal is because in that part of the world, if you say you're from India, you, you, you become like a hero. They're like, my God, why would you leave India, that beautiful democratic paradise to come to this Narak, this horrible place? And that too as a journalist. So he did that. He got free. I, I got like abducted separately. I remembered it. I said it. They fed the both of us really well. They took us to their houses. It's a different story that those people who kidnapped us now are probably ISIS terrorists themselves. But, but uh, yeah, it, it was fabulous. You, know, you see how he's smiling. You realize the problem. When we were talking about, uh, you know, what makes somebody courageous or do crazy things, depending on how you see it, look at how he's smiling. This is when his family is concerned, his father, his mother, his wife, daughter, and he's like smiling. And that really is the josh. Uh, Rahul, what's the toughest situation that you've been in? Well, I've uh, never been kidnapped or shot at. <laughs> you need to spend more time with these guys. <laughs> but, uh, They'll I'll find a way of getting you there. I'll tell you an interesting incident which actually shows uh, the kind of uh, work we do and the kind of uh, work uh, our soldiers do. So this was uh, 2008. I was reporting out of Congo for a few, uh, for a few weeks. Uh, General Bipin Rawat was then the brigade commander over there. And I was traveling extensively, and um, I was with this uh, army detachment at a place called uh, um, Nyara Gongo, uh, which is, uh, uh, you know, right next to the Virunga National Park. So you have uh, the active volcano on one side, and you have Lake Kivu on the other side. And uh, our forces and, um, were, were the buffer zone between uh, General Lauren uh, Kunda's private general's forces and the Congolese forces. So our job was to keep them away, buffer zones, two kilometers, three kilometers, four kilometers. So at, and we were sleeping in tents over there. I was staying with this uh, uh, unit, I think it was six, Chesik. And um, we had these, um, you know, anti-aircraft guns booming, bullets flying all around. And there was a massive earthquake at night. And I was in the tent with a young major. So I think his name was Saurabh, if I remember rightly. I said, Saurabh, do something. What should we do? He said, sir, go back to sleep. If we run this way, there's an active volcano. It's going to explode. If we go that way, there's Lake Kivu, which has, uh, which is known, also known as an exploding lake. So, you know, it can let out a lot of poisonous gases, uh, which are trapped over there. So he says, either way, <laughs> I mean, we have no choice. So this is the kind of, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the, you know exp part of the experiences one has had as a uh, defense writer, reporter. You know, the amazing thing about uh, India's most fearless is that it's capturing stories of modern day heroism. So it's not just about what happened in the 62 war or what happened in the 71 war or what happened during Kargil. And Shiva, I think that's important because very often, for many people, somebody's death or act of bravery is something you acknowledge when it happens, when you see the last rites, or when you see a citation being accepted by their family or mother, father, wife uh, during one of our national events. And otherwise, it's just a lost memory. It's just something people forget, and this keeps them going. Uh, you actually uh, said it exactly like it is, uh, Rahul. We constantly get asked about why we uh, actually you know, even wrote this book. And one of the reasons is precisely that, that uh, on Republic Day and Independence Day every year, uh, there are a bunch of press releases that the government issues with, you know, single paragraph citations about someone's... Uh, uh, you know, feet for a Shorya Chakra or a Veer Chakra or whatever it is. And it always, it, it always felt, felt so odd that 
uh, you know, someone's incredible uh, newspapers every single year. So uh, we decided that I think these are stories that need to be told, uh, not because they are, uh, you know, inspirational or nationalistic, because these are actually incredible stories about people like us, you know, uh, you know, uh, like Rahul was saying, these are people with normal families, people paying their normal EMIs. You know, 4Gs are not superhumans. They, they, they face the same nonsense as all of us do on a daily basis and in addition to living between life and death. So, you know, those are the kind of people we were actually writing about. So, I think it was uh, an incredible experience really capturing that aspect of you it. Know, Rahul. 4Gs are totally normal <laughs> till the one day they are not. Yeah. When they decide either on their own or because their commanding officer has asked them to, to do something which history will record and remember and about which potentially films would be made or stories would be told and people would cry uh, long after they are gone. Uh, Gaurav, a lot of this getting captured and I see now you're a part of a very active army literature festival uh, circuit which essentially means that these stories are being celebrated. It's not something which is just done and forgotten. Uh, but something which is actively remembered, celebrated, cherished. People hear those stories, very often get inspired by them. Rahul, a nation needs its heroes. And a nation like ours, which is constantly at war, uh, you know, whether uh, it's at the Pakistan border, whether it's the tension at the China border, uh, and we saw the flare-up at Galwan that, that we reported, uh, or the situation in Doklam or Arunachal Pradesh, uh, or our Navy or the Air Force, or even counter-terror operations. Our nation from 1947 has been at war constantly. Uh, the fact that all of us can sit here and celebrate and celebrate our, our Holi and Diwali and Eid and Christmas is because we have our soldiers there. Um, the fact that we're able to recount their tales of unparalleled valor uh, inspires the next generation of soldiers. Um, uh, that is something which is extremely um, interesting. What I also found remarkable, Rahul, uh, when I was interacting with these soldiers, uh, you know, when you write, so for example, Cargill, um, you know, the, the 155 mm howitzers, they were seen as a game changer. Till then, everyone talked about Bofors and the controversy. But in Cargill, when 100 guns boomed together on Tololing or on Tiger Hill, that's when the entire nation started saying, yes, we need modern artillery, something that your father, uh, you know, Brigadier uh, Gurmeet Kamal had been talking about and writing about so extensively that we need modern artillery. Um, and, and ask anyone, which, uh, you remember that, that, that movie, um, uh, Troy, when Hector is asked, uh, you know, the gods are on our side. He says, no, gods are on the side of the bigger battalion. Gods are always on the side of those who have modern artillery and modern uh, armor and modern infantry and the fighting spirit. So we are able to tell those stories because we are just lucky enough to be on ground zero and to be able to report all these stories. It's one of the most majestic sights if you've seen. Uh, whole host of artillery guns booming. You've seen some of those images during the Kargil war. There is nothing that gives you greater goosebumps than to see the Indian artillery fire. And what a majestic sight that is. Uh, they used to be booming right around my school when I was growing up. So we used to have broken window panes virtually every second week with some gun causing a window pane to go. It was a lot of fun. It, stopped, it would stop the class for a while, but hey, so what? You know, it's very difficult to ask a parent to pick a favorite child. So I won't do that. But rather I'd get our guests to talk about the one story and narrate that story in a couple of minutes, uh, which you find most remarkable. This is obviously not their favorite war hero because that would be very unfair. But just one story, you've got uh, people sitting here at Sahitya, and you can tell us, Gaurav, in Hindi, in English, pick your language, tell us the story like your father would. You know his father, right? We all grew up listening to his commentary during uh, Republic Day. He can do a mini light version of his father, not as good as Brigadier Savant, of course, but uh, he can try that. So you give us your story, okay? So here it is, two, two and a half minutes, tell us the story. So one of the most remarkable aspects uh, of conflict I found was, was faith. Faith in, in your commanding officer, faith in the men you fight with, and faith in God. Um, the, again, uh, I'll, I'll get back to the time when Tiger Hill had to be won. And Tiger Hill was one of the most difficult battles. So you had all these guns lined up. 
but then there had been a series of reverses uh, our boys went up couldn't succeed came back bodies were coming back every other day so the, to boost the morale you had the religious teacher and uh, you know those who are from the armed forces would realize religious teacher plays a very important role in any battalion uh, because he would boost your morale and there there was a havan with a new gun coming in so bakayda ek kalava bandha tilak kiya aur uske baad geeta ka ek updesh tha जो उस रिलीजियस टीचर ने उन जवानों को बताया एंड एंड दैट बिकेम एक्चुअली समथिंग दैट आई रियली स्वे बाय नाउ योगेश्वर श्री कृष्ण टेल्स अर्जुन हतोवा प्राप्यसी स्वर्गम जितवा व भोक्षसी महीम तस्मा दुतिष्ट कौनते युद्धाय कृत निश्चय एंड एंड दिस मीन्स दैट इफ यू वेन यू फाइट बैटल if you die in battle you will go to heaven if you win the battle you will rule over this earth that is as beautiful as heaven that is why o son of kunti take a firm resolve and fight and that is what an army must do fight fight to win whatever the consequences that story has stayed with me forever rahul tell us your favorite story so i'll uh, just deviate from uh, hardcore combat and i'll pick up from where pandit chorasia left in the uh, previous session so he said ki agar aap kuch dil se karte ho sincerity se karte ho to bhagwan bhi aapki madad karte hain i'll talk about an operation a mission which took place it's one of the craziest uh, rescue missions uh, uh, not rescue actually it was a retrieval mission shiv and i have heard and written about this is about uh, two navy divers called uh, ashok kumar and veer singh If you remember, in 2015, there was a Navy Donia crash in which, uh, you know, a, a Navy woman officer died for the first time. Her name was Lieutenant Kiran Chakravat, and um, luckily the pilot was uh, rescued, but the co-pilot, uh, Lieutenant Abhinav Nagori, also died. And uh, the Donia was um, uh, resting on the seabed. So I won't go into how it was uh, located and all that. But uh, so there was this uh, team of clearance divers which was summoned from uh, uh, from Bombay. and uh, these two guys decided to go down and now they realized that the uh, the sea was very rough extremely rough and um, the day they went for the mission it was calm and um, the uh, it was at 60 meters and these divers are qualified to operate only at 50 55 meters also their equipment can operate only at 50 55 meters but these guys knew that you know the families were waiting to hear about uh, their loved ones there had to be a sense of closure they were given a choice whether they want to go in for it or not but these guys decided to go in for it there were two dangers one was when going down at those depths uh, they could suffer uh, from a condition called uh, nitrogen narcosis and while coming up because of uh, rapid decrease in pressure something called decompression sickness which can be terrible but these guys still went there they used their brute strength to kind of pull apart those doors that mesh of wires and uh, over two successive days retrieved uh, the bodies of the lady officer and uh, and the co pilot and uh, shivan i were talking to uh, commander ashok kumar so he says uh, coming back to the uh, you know that sense of purpose and sincerity he says jab aap koi kaam dil se karte ho jab aap koi kaam selflessly karte ho to bhagwan bhi aapke sath hota hai kehta hai jis the day we launched the mission usse pehle the sea state was crazy the day we finished the mission again it was bad but during those two two days while we were there he says the sea was as calm as a swimming pool shit uh, uh, since we've already spoken about the army and the navy i'll uh, uh, i'll tell you a quick story about the air force which is a story in our book rahul uh, this is a guy which i i'm sure people who haven't read the book you've never heard of this guy his name is squadron leader ishan mishra flying a sukhoi 30 fighter at something like 50 or 60 feet okay really really low altitude fighter completely out of control nothing the cockpit is not answering anything everything is out of control is about to crash there's a village like in his path and uh, two pilots they, uh, and this guy is sitting in front uh, and uh, like literally about a few seconds rahul before the fighter hits the ground he ejects like tries his best to save the fighter can't do it ejects blacks out uh, imagine ejecting at like some something like 25 30 feet 
lands, crashes into a village in some kind of swamp. And, and Shiv, he delays that because he's flying over a village. Yeah, he's try, he was trying to delay the ejection so that he doesn't hit the village. So he manages to avoid the village. Aircraft bangs into the outskirts of the village and this guy is like, lands in some horrible swamp somewhere. Completely out, unconscious. Uh, and when he uh, gains consciousness, like blinding lights, little bit people, villagers pointing torches at him, he can hear someone say, where is his leg? Okay, he says, where is his leg? And uh, I, I, I won't spoil the story, but basically what happened was his leg got ripped off during the ejection because it was at such low altitude, something went wrong. So his leg got torn off during the ejection and the leg landed somewhere else. And then he goes to the hospital. He's, he's pumped full of uh, painkillers and morphine, whatever it is. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Rahul. He, he said, I was so completely pumped full of medicines. And imagine a fighter pilot losing your leg. Your, your career is gone. Okay. And uh, apparently his friends and his family said the only thing he kept saying after gaining consciousness is... Yeah, koi mujhe cold coffee pila do, yaar. Cold coffee. He had a craving for cold coffee. So people brought crates of Amul Cool and kept it there. And apparently he finished all of it. He says, I don't remember anything but having this craving for cold coffee. And uh, uh, he didn't spend even a single moment grieving for his career. Imagine losing a leg. Anyone. But imagine a fighter pilot. That's your thing. You can't fly without one leg. Well, he immediately enrolled himself to a rehabilitation place got himself a, a, a you know a, a prosthetic a leg which is like half bionic it's he's he's able to jog and the great news rahul is he's just put in an application to the air force saying i can fly transport aircraft please let me back into the cockpit and, you know, uh, rahul and he's currently undergoing the staff course at wellington wow. wow that's quite quite a character fighter pilots are crazy people uh, crazy because if you're not a fighter pilot, you're very jealous of them. Uh, if you are a fighter pilot, it's the coolest place to be. And uh, spend a moment Shiv, talking about Abhinandan Vartaman because that's the one guy all of you know. He uh, says he couldn't hear the instruction which was being given to him. I had a few fighter pilots who were not fighter pilots when we grew up but became fighter pilots later. I am pretty certain he could hear what was being said and he decided to do it. Rahul, he was trying to behave like Gaurav and Shiv when they went to yeah, Libya. Yeah, when they went you. to Libya, they said, Hame aawaz nahi aari, hum to ja rahe. It's a bit like that. And just imagine, you got a MiG-21 up against an F-16. An F-16, even the ones the Pakis have, uh, is much better than a MiG-21, unfortunately. And it's really a no clash. It's like a Maruti 800 versus a Mercedes. You know how it's going to end. And it ended with the Mercedes losing, Shiv. Uh, uh, you know, I don't think Pakistan is ever going to forget losing a modern fighter to a MiG-21. You know, all the years of bad things that have been said about MiG-21s ended on that one day. I mean, there are many problems, but that one thing that Abhirandan Vartaman did basically said, boss, you can't say anything bad about MiG-21s now. Like Rahul said, an alto went against a Mercedes and won that day. Uh, uh, you know, what happened to Abhinandan Vartaman in the air that day, Rahul, is, is something that uh, a lot of people actually say. There's a, you know, w when, that, when that end game kicks in, when that killer instinct kicks in, when you're up against the enemy and you know that, you know, you have it, I've got it, I, I have this, you know, this guy's in my sights, I can do this. But your radar controller is saying, boss, wapas aja, or, or you can't do this. All the rules go straight out the window. Here's a guy, you know, even now, and I think Rahul also knows this, Abhirandan Vartaman could have very easily been court-martialed, you know, uh, at that point of time. And I don't think any of those things crossed his mind. He just said, look, I've got a lock, I've got a missile ready, doesn't matter what I'm going to do, I'm going to take this guy down. Baad mein jo kuch hota hai, we'll see. That's what happened. And the amazing thing is, he's still so normal. You know, like you meet him, you're thinking of, oh my God, this is the guy who went into Pakistan and brought down the F-16. You've got just goosebumps just seeing him. And Gaurav, he's totally nonchalant about it. Yeah, that happened. You know, now what's happening and life goes on. That's in the past. Of course, he's a hero. He's a hero for the Air Force. He's a hero for India. But he's just a totally normal guy. Somebody you can sit with, whether it's cold coffee or we're in the middle of the afternoon at Sahitya. So I can't say anything else, but you can get a drink with the guy. Absolutely. And, and he's... 
stuff that legends are made of because he will inspire another generation of air warriors they would want to be like him they will defy whatever orders they're given when you have a kill and you will get that kill because in history he'll go down as the only man ever on a mig 21 to have taken down an f16 so bad was the situation that the americans are also trying to hide that information because it's the reputation of the f16 that's actually gone to the dogs courtesy pakistan but uh, you know that that's point 1 point 2 is how he handles himself in a very difficult situation so there you are when you land you don't know whether you're in india or you're in pakistan occupied kashmir so he says bharat mata ki jai when he sees the hostile reaction he knows at least he's in pok then he's being assaulted he doesn't give up rahul even there he holds himself with poise he just gives out his military number his name and rank because that's the only thing he's supposed to give out when he's asked how's the tea you know pakistan is very excited about that uh, tea was fantastic look at his attitude i mean he's like an absolute rock star and the pakistanis knew it also perhaps the fact that our air force knows that in case something like that happens there is there is the air force that's ready and there was an establishment that is ready subsequently that we heard that the pakistanis were scared ki army chief ke pair kahan pare the ki aaj ki raat qatl ki raat ho jayegi so that is something is is that change in attitude of a nation which tells the adversary you don't mess around with this country it gives confidence to everyone rahul that you are in pakistan you know your country your armed forces have your back and they'll come and get you see it's also about ethos and uh, values uh, and uh, i'll uh, i'll uh, tell you a small story related to abhinandan only so this was the 27th of feb and i was uh, uh, driving to my office when i suddenly saw these uh, images of this young pilot uh, being uh, you know the all of us all of us have seen those images so i immediately called up an air force friend and i asked him if uh, to identify this guy so he says he's uh, abhinandan vartaman i asked him is he air marshal vartaman's son he said yes he's air marshal vartaman's son Air Marshal Vartaman was uh, was a friend of is a friend of mine, and I'd known him when he was in service. Now settled in Chennai, I immediately called up uh, Air Marshal Vartaman. I said, "Sir, terrible. Uh, how are you holding up?" He says, "Don't worry. He's a brave. He's a brave guy, and he's a good son. He'll weather this storm." So that's the kind of uh, uh, you know. While Abhinandan was brave, and all of us saw his bravery on television. and everywhere and uh, it was recognized with the veer chakra but uh, these aspects about his father i mean you would never know uh, air marshal vartaman but that is that is the kind of values these guys have grown up with and that is how their parents feel about their kid being in uh, be, be, being held as prisoner of war or you know, i mean in fact his father was totally cool this is when he's with the pakistanis as a virtual prisoner of war uh, as a captive his father is telling others calm down relax he'll be fine now his son is in the captivity of the pakistani army everyone's calling and going crazy and is very worried very naturally and the father who son is across the border is saying he'll be fine don't worry uh, you don't have to stress he'll be fine he'll come back and that is just uh, you know kudos to the attitude of uh, the indian army and the families that make up the indian army so uh, what happens next is there a india's most fearless four coming i have a recommendation uh, there was this amazing operation uh this is when the people's liberation army was amassed on the opposite side of uh, pangong so lake in ladakh and india was running out of options and there's a lot of pressure on the armed forces and on the government to do something in the middle of the night and some people that i knew and grew up with climbed up a mountain top and went and sat on the heads of the moldo garrison of the people's liberation army so i don't know if you're planning to tell that story but that is a story that's worth telling because on that day if things had gone wrong two of the largest armies in the world could potentially have been at war and that is just a fascinating story shiv that's waiting to be told uh, uh, the good news is the only reason we didn't tell that story in this book rahul is because while we were writing the book that operation was actually taking place so it was a story in motion and we couldn't have done it but i promise you it's going to be in the next book there are many more india's most fearless uh, books that are going to uh, come because um, i don't think valor is uh, ever going to be in short supply from the indian armed forces uh, we uh, are very keen not only to cover 
uh, counter-terror operations. Our book also covers, uh, you know, humanitarian relief operations, selflessness in service, people saving other people's lives. Uh, so, yeah, there's a, there's a long way to go for these books. Gaurav, what an amazing story. You've got the PLA uh, deployed all across in a state of operational alert. You go and sit on their heads in a way that chokes them and gives you the kind of leverage that people thought uh, was simply in, uh, impossible given the kind of adversary you were up against. And this in a country that, you know, fought and lost the 62 war. You know, uh, the 62 war was uh, fought and lost by some in the mind before it was lost on ground. And the difference between 62 uh, and uh, the current situation is that this is a war that's, and, and, and thank you for sending me to Galwan and to uh, DBO, uh, because uh, that's again um, a, a situation where we were able to see firsthand the manner in which our soldiers were deployed at Dalat Beg Oldie. Uh, you know, which is where uh, the, the, the Chinese were trying to come in in a big way, but our army preempted them in certain locations. Um, our army preempted them by going on top of the Moldo garrison um, and, and overlooking the garrison. So, not in their wildest dreams, perhaps the Chinese thought that the Indian army would come and dominate them. Now, you also see why Shiv and Gaurav have the best job in our newsroom. <laughs> I'm stuck managing news lists. They're the ones in Dalat Beg, Oldie, Libya, having all the fun. Can I request you all, uh, as we bring this session to an end, to stand with me for one minute as we remember the selfless fortitude, the courage, the josh, the nationalism, the patriotism, and the fervor of our brave Javans, army officers, Air Force, Navy, uh, who help tell the kind of stories that Rahul, Shiv, and Gaurav have spoken of and written about. And we just remember them and their loved ones, their families, their children, their mother, their father, just for a moment, close your eyes and say a prayer. So in the army, there is a tradition. When you remember the soldiers who've made the supreme sacrifice of their lives, there is the last post. But after the last post, there is always the rouse. Because you rise again to defend your country. And may I request you all to join me in saying, Bharat Mata Ki Jai! Bharat Mata Ki Jai! Bharat Mata Ki Jai! Thank you so much. It was fantastic having you with us at Sahitya English. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Our guest is here for the next session, so we'll just start there. Thank you very much.